Today the reading is in Matthew 26, 37 through 39. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So be it. morning. If you'll bow your heads with me, we'll start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this beautiful world that you have created for us that declares your glory, Lord, that you know the stars and you call them by name, that you desire to create us, to be in a relationship with us. And Lord, as we listen to your words today, we think about the things that we've read, and as we go further in our reading into Deuteronomy and Acts, Lord, help us to think about your laws and the fact that we are your children, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Help us to live a life empowered by the Spirit and a life of urgency as if this was the last decade, if this was even the last year or so. Lord, how would we live differently? It shouldn't matter, but the early church, as we start reading Acts, gave up everything because they knew you were coming back. So they had urgency to live out your laws and to teach others before that door was shut, Lord, before you separated the goats and the sheep. May we be your faithful children until we meet Jesus face to face. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I entitled this The Proper Mindset. And I had Polly read from uh, Matthew, which you should have read this week. You should have read Jer- Jeremiah 34 to 50. You'll finish up Jeremiah this week. You should have read the Matthew 26, verse 47 to the end, and you started the book of Philippians, which I'll uh, talk mostly about the book of Philippians. You're going to be reading Joel. You're going to be reading Deuteronomy. You're going to be reading Acts in the next little uh, couple weeks. I'm going to start with Jeremiah chapter 33. Go back one chapter. Even though captivity was coming, discipline was coming for God's people because he was trying to turn them to him, to show them their adulterous ways, to show him how much that he loved them but yet they'd been unfaithful to him. And as we read Matthew, you see the passion of Jesus and how faithful he was, how humble he was, how loving he was, all because he did not want you to not be a part of the family of God. If only the children of Israel would have listened to Jeremiah, if only they would have turned, if only they would have obeyed. But even in captivity, you see that God is still in control. He's in control of all the kings and kingdoms of this world, and they will answer for him. And again, I'll remind you that you are a group of priests and kings, that you are God's children. You know, we went back to Georgia again for for this past week, going through some more things of, of Sherry's dad. She is his heir. You are heirs of God Almighty because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Are you living that out? Are you living responsibly with the things that you've been given, the riches that you have been given? If only God's children would have turned. And Jeremiah was faithful. He didn't have a wife. He didn't have children. His scroll was was torn torn up and burned. He was thrown into prison. Then he was thrown into a cistern to die. But he kept preaching the word which the world didn't want to hear. But it was God's love story telling them to just repent and come back to him. And that every one, God is in control of everything in this world. They all are His. So why don't we obey like nature or the stars or anything else? Because we have a choice. So will you choose to follow after Jesus because of the passion that He's given to, to you? How much do you love and trust in Babylon? You know, we don't think Babylon's not here, but don't we trust a lot in the security and freedom that we have in this country? Do you love and trust in those things more than you love and trust in Jesus? Do you live for those things? Do you listen to the Lord's direction and His discipline if it is discipline? Because He's trying to drive you into His loving arms. 
you understand this about kings and kingdoms and that we all, every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Doesn't it make sense to do it now? The last chapters of Jeremiah dealt with what God was going to do to these different kingdoms, that they are all going to answer to Him. So how are you going to answer on that day? You haven't read chapters 51 and 52 yet, but I'll give you a little spoiler alert about them. In, in chapter 51, God warns His ch children time and time again. In Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 5, we read, For Israel and Judah have not been forsaken by their God, the Lord Almighty, Though their land is full of guilt before the Holy One of Israel, flee from Babylon, run for your lives. Do not be destroyed because of her sins. It is time for the Lord's vengeance. He will repay her for what she deserves. And the chapter ends with the words of Jeremiah in here. You've read for three weeks about Jeremiah's call to God's children to act and live like God's children should. Heirs of the King to live in this world as foreigners, as exiles, to be obedient to Him, to be a holy set-apart people so that the world will see God's love for them. Not, so, not for the fact that they'll be absorbed to the, from in the world and they don't see seen any differently than anybody else in the world. Chapter 51 then retells the fall of Jerusalem and the final words are of hope. The king of Judah is released so that he is sitting at the king's table his prison clothes are changed for garments that he can wear in the king's palace. Are you wearing the robes of righteousness that Jesus Christ has given you? In Matthew chapter 25, there were parables about the wise and foolish virgins and how they're supposed to be ready with their lamps burning, waiting for the wedding, which could be in this decade. I think will be even sooner than that. I think it will be in the next few years. Should I live differently because of that? Or should I live like the children of God did in Acts? And they live by the power of the Holy Spirit as, as in each and every day were the day that Jesus were returning. He said he would be returning soon. And he, you will answer to him for what you have done. The next parable talked about the stewards who were given their master's wealth to invest until he returns. Would you take your money and set it aside and not invest it today for your future? No, you invest it and do it for your future. Are you investing the power that the Holy Spirit has given you to live holy, set-apart lives, to transform you into the image of Jesus? Is that how you li are living? Because verse 31 of Matthew 25 says, When the Son of Man does come in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. If that is the fact that is, we know is going to happen, are we worshiping Jesus? Are we bowing down to Him today and serving Him, being good stewards of what He's given, given to us? And would you live any differently if you knew today was your last day? There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when, God, when Jesus separates the goats from the sheep. And the difference that chapter told us and how the, the, you can tell the goats and the sheep in this world today is but by what they do, their loving acts of kindness for even the least of these. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did as you read Matthew? Isn't that what he taught? So the proper mindset is what I entitled this. What is your mindset in relationships? You ever think, of, you think about love, but you think about humility. Because even if you love someone else, how are you going to love them and think more about them than you do yourself without first humbling yourself? See, that pride is the reason you don't want to bow down. That pride is what says, oh, no, it's about me rather than about you. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Thinking of others over you. Thinking if this was the last decade, if this was the last year, if this was the last day, how would you live your life differently for God and for others? Would you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength? And would you do loving acts of kindness for someone else to show them the love of God through Jesus Christ, your Lord and King? Our King gave up His throne. He became a servant. Then He sacrificed His life. That was His mindset that brought Him from heaven to earth and humbled him to go to the cross the ultimate death of humiliation and suffering all because he wanted to restore you into God's family what was his mindset before he ever left heaven 
that he would give up his glory for the very creation that he created that said, no way, I don't want to follow you. The rest of, the rest of creation follows everything, follows the laws of the Lord. But you have the choice. And for decade after decade, we see century after century, we see the stubborn, stick, stiff-neckedness of God's so-called people, children. Will you love Him back? Will you be faithful to Him? What is your mindset? What is your mind set on then? Is it on the things of this world or the Creator of all things and how you can use these things to bring Him glory and honor and draw others into the kingdom? What was the mindset when he came? And he spent time on scriptures and didn't worry about the things that he had and his joy set before him was the cross. What about what was his mindset in the Garden of Gethsemane that night when he asked his friends to stay and watch with him, to wait up with him as he was so deeply perplexed into his spirit that he sweat drops of blood. In Matthew 26, thinking of those things as I read this, thinking of Jesus' mindset, verse 36 says, And Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. Now, I have to be honest with you, my prayer life is not near what it should be when I look at Jesus' example, when I look at his dependency on prayer and the dependency on the Holy Spirit and his desire to do God's will as a man, flesh and blood. He spent that night praying. I would have wanted to get rest. <laughs> he spent that night praying. What did he pray for? Have you ever thought about it? How much was his prayers about you and I? He took Peter and two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He didn't want to be alone. He wanted you with him, regardless of what you would do, regardless that Peter would deny him. He still wanted his friends with him, his brothers and he was sorrowful and deeply troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Not that he was facing death and that was causing him sorrow. He was sorrowful to the point of dying in his spirit because of what he had to do to save you. You take that thought process wherever you want it. We don't know exactly. But I, if, if I'm sitting there praying for my wife or my grandson or my son or whatever because of what might happen to them I am sorrowful to death willing to give up my life if, if just they would be okay he was praying for me not what he had to do wouldn't you do whatever you had to do to save that child he was praying for me he was praying for you and he was troubled and overwhelmed that he dropped sweats of blood we don't find that here in Matthew but we find it when we read the other gospels and he said, stay here and keep watch. Stay awake with me. I need you in these hours of trouble. Verse 39, going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. That he only wanted the will of the father, no matter what it would cost. Oh, I can't contemplate this. God himself, well, he's a God man, he's fully flesh, but God himself being ripped and torn apart from God for me. Everything that he is, his deity and control of everything, ripped apart from him and facing the wrath of God for me. I can't begin to describe it. Verse 40, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping instead of staying watch with him. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray. I need your prayers also. You need your prayers so that you will not fall into temptation. Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Oh, how much does that apply to me? I want to do what I, what I should do, but I continue to do the things that I don't do. That's my words, not Paul's, but they're very close. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done, lest I fully face your wrath to save them. 
because I don't want this child, this brother, this sister of mine to die in their sins. That is the passion that was overwhelming Jesus to where literally his capillaries were bursting and blood was coming out in sweat drops because he was in such distress. Verse 43, when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing again. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hand of sinners to pay the price of your sins, my sins, everybody's sins, for all eternity that we would be pardoned. This is your salvation. No works of righteousness are going to save you. Nothing else. And, and you have a hope that others in this world don't have, period. <clears throat> I hear all the time, oh, I hope this person's in a better place. I hope this, that. You have a hope that is inexpressible. But you have the words that will come from the Holy Spirit to express it. When that time comes, if you're praying, if you're reading God's Word, if you're in fellowship with one another, if you realize the great commission that Jesus has set before you, and that all authority and power has been given to you, to make disciples, to share the gospel message. Is that how you're living your life? Are you caught up in Babylon, living your life for yourself because your mindset is not on the things of Christ and you don't think he's coming back in this decade, let alone this year or let alone tomorrow? As you read, the, I'll say it again, as you read through Acts, look at the urgency that people had. To where even Barnabas, the son of encouragement, sold property that he had and laid it at the apostles' feet. He didn't ask how this is going to be distributed or anything else. He just said, I don't need this. I need to tell others about Jesus Christ. And the apostles called him a son of encouragement. Matthew 27, the only rec words recorded of Jesus in that chapter are, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did you notice that? Why have you forsaken me? And I'll tell you why. To save you. Period. Do you understand this? And if you understand this gift that you have been given to, are you using it wisely? Using the power of the Holy Spirit that is inside of you to live a life differently, to let your light shine. And then Matthew 28, if you have believed, here's your commission, you know it. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, because of who I am, what I've done for you, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. How are you going to teach your children to obey if you're not obeying yourself? Uh, you realize that. The biggest problem that our children have is you say, don't do this, and they watch you do it. teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you till the very end of the age. <clears throat> so Paul lays out clearly. That's why I told you I was going to spend more time in Philippians. He lays out clearly the mindset of the one who gave his life for me. God himself, the Son of God, sacrificed for my sins. God who created everything, who became flesh and blood, to die for me. Christmas, the mass, the death of Christ. He came to die. That is the salvation plan. To save me. His blood poured out to save mine so that I might live. And in Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 8, if you didn't see that there, you have basically the hymn of Christ. It might have been a hymn for the early church. We don't know for sure. But you have what Jesus Christ did in this short little two-sentence hymn. That he gave up heaven and he was raised to glory and he did it for you and I. It's an instructional letter to the church written several years after Jesus' death. How to live their lives. Don't forget who we are. Don't forget where we passed through some of the early parts of Acts. Here we are today. Jesus hasn't returned yet, but he'll be returning soon. How are you living? You need to have the proper mindset. 
so that your heart and mind is not set on the things of the world and the things I want, but I think of others more than myself because that's exactly what Jesus did. God himself thought of me more than him being God. Jesus emptied himself, made himself nothing, Scripture says, and then humbled himself to the death on a cross, a criminal's death that he did not deserve for me. 2 Corinthians, Paul writes to the church there in, verse, in chapter 8, verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. The verse continues, So that through his poverty you might become rich. Not just a child, he emptied himself so that he could raise you up. With the Spirit of God living inside of you. As you read Deuteronomy, consider all that again. Consider the jobs of the priesthood and the law and everything else. And that the Spirit comes to live inside of you. The Old Testament prophets would have never even imagined this. So that you can be that representative of Jesus Christ, God's ultimate sign of love to the world who so desperately, desperately, desperately needs it because they're caught up in the ways of Babylon. Are they not? Especially now, because they want anything and everything that pleases me now. Not only to save me, but so that I could become rich. Jesus went from the heaven to the cross and back to heaven. And he take whoever with him who will come and follow after him. Do you understand what he's done for you? You consider it all, and I would <laughs> plead with you to consider more, Jesus' mindset of everything that he did in the flesh. After, like I said, after he's given up heaven and everything, but he did not live for himself. He lived and died for you and I. So what should your mindset be today and every day until he returns? How many days do you have? We don't know. Shouldn't we live each and every day with the mindset of Jesus Christ who humbled himself, gave up his deity, let it all go, emptied everything, and exchanged it to be a human slave, tortured, spit upon, mocked, beaten, crucified to save you. No one killed him. He gave his life willingly to save you. Because that's his mindset. His mind was set on his love for you. So let's look at Philippians a little bit. Verse 1, Paul says this letter is from Paul and Timothy. Look at Paul's life, where he's at now, where he was before and the things he gave up in the world because he met Jesus face to face. And he's in prison, he's beaten, he's left for dead, everything else. And here he is down the road, and how many followers does he have? He's got a lot of churches, but I'll tell you right off, that's not necessarily a bunch of followers. <laughs> this is a great church with probably the number of followers. But church in many places is just a socialization. It's because people want to belong, but they don't understand, they don't serve the Lord. And that's a terrible thing. And we see these different letters because there's constantly... False prophets bringing in different teachings to try to corrupt the church and to sway them from the truth. So we have to be focused on each and every day, living our lives by the power of the Spirit, combined together, realizing that each of us has a gift from the Spirit, and we have a mission by Jesus Christ Himself, given the authority and the power to accomplish it, to make disciples and teaching them to obey everything that He taught us to obey. And who does He have? He has Timothy. You'll read letters of Timothy later. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of people lined up. Jesus had 12 or 11, <laughs> however you want to look at it. Paul has Timothy here, and they're writing. It says to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus, Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. Did you catch that? First it says to all God's holy people. It says first to the church, then to the elders and the pastor. First to the church. Don't forget, 
Just because you might have a few leaders in the church doesn't mean anything different. They're just a different part of the body. You all have integral parts. You're all valuable. You all have, a, have something that you've got to contribute and something you have to do. And if it's not working right, even the most insignificant part that you think, oh, all of a sudden you're bedridden because you're not playing your part in the body of Christ. To all God's holy people. Is that who you are? Sanctified and set apart? In Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. Grace and peace to you. Why? So you can live a life like you want, enjoy the things you want, or so that you can be gracious and be a peacemaker in this world. Verse 3. I thank my God every time that I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray. Here we've got pray. Pray, 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 pray for each other so that we don't fall into temptation. Jesus' last words to his disciples before he went to the cross. I always pray with joy. Why? Because of your partnership. Did you catch that? Because you guys are partnered with me in going out and living for, the, for Jesus in this world, telling them about God's salvation. Are you partnered with me? Are you as enthusiastic as I am? I need your enthusiasm too. I need your prayers also. You need my prayers. We're doing this together. We're the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in Babylon. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, nothing's changed. Being confident in this, that he who began a work in you, not you, but God who began this work, creating his masterpiece in Christ Jesus before things were ever do done so that you would do good works. That's referring to Ephesians 2.10. Who began a good work in you, he will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus when you meet him face to face. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. I think about you more than I think about myself. That's why I do the things I do. That's why I'm in prison now. That's why I'm, my chains are the gospel message because I care about your salvation. That's the mindset of Jesus Christ. That's what keeps us going. Since I have all of you in my heart, and whether I'm in change or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. He writes these words from prison. Verse 8, God can testify how long, how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Not just that I love you, but I love you enough to lay down my life for you. It is what I live for, to see that you are saved. Verse 9, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more, so that you know the love of Christ Jesus in your heart. Because you consider it joy to go to your cross, whatever it might be, so that you can save others, especially your family, your friends, your children. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Not best for you, best for others, so that on that day, all of us are together, plus all of those that we've come in contact out there that would listen. Not that I have the things of this world, but I use the things of this world to help others have things, so that's why I could have the mindset to sell everything I have and lay it at the apostles' feet, so that there were no needy people among them. No one had need. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. So here we get this example. You thought I was in prison and you were worried about me praying for me. And let me tell you what God's been doing here in this prison ministry. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Instead of being scared, instead of running away, they said, hey, we don't have anything to fear. If we die, so what? 
We need to keep on working. And in fact, since Paul's in prison, we need to do it even more. Verse 15. It is true that some preach out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love. Why Jesus went to the cross for you. But you've got to humble yourself or you'll, you'll say, I have love for you. And as James says, you say, I love you. Go in peace, but you don't take care of the person's needs. You hypocrite. What good is your faith without deeds? Knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel, the former preach Christ out of self-ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains, making it worse for Paul. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, that Christ is preached. Remember when the disciples came up to Jesus and said, hey, they're casting out, out demons. <laughs> Jesus said, go ahead and let them. And because of this I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body. Now, that includes your words, doesn't it? But doesn't that include what you do? If, if all I do is sit here and talk, my body's not doing a whole lot, is it? Because I have to put those words into action again. And how I think of others over myself, how I am rich with what God has given me, especially the Holy Spirit, even if it costs me my freedom. Whether by life or death. Well, that's the ultimate, isn't it? Whether it costs me my life. Then we've got verse 21. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Okay? Dying is gain. I will be, spend eternity with Jesus Christ my Lord. But my life is because he has given it to me and the power to do it, the authority to do it, to go out and be his witness, his hands and feet, to have his mindset in this world so that I am a Christian, a little Christ or like Christ. Christ in this world how can I do that if my love is divided if my mind is divided worrying about the things of this world rather than worrying about you and them and everyone else if I am going to go on living in the body this will mean fruitful labor for me that's what I'm going to do yet what shall I choose I don't know I have torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Not for him, not for the things that he'll have or anything else, but for you so that you're grounded in your faith, so that you understand, and so that you will follow raising up disciples and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has taught. Convinced of this... Verse 25, I know that I will remain then and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith to help you grow to maturity so that through my being with you again it, it, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. But whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Any job that you have, do you, do you work hard to be worthy of it? What about the commission that God has given you? Can you say that you're working towards that? Not that your works of righteousness save you, but because of the mindset that you have, the passion in your heart that you have, that you're walking worthy of the gospel of Christ. The good news that God loves the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever will believe in them will not perish but will have everlasting life. Right? That's what you're working for, the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or I only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but you will be saved. Because of your firm faith, whatever happens to you, they will see the truth in you. 
that you have what they don't have. Whether they accept it or not, that's between them and God. But it's between you and God what you do with the life that He has purchased back from, the, from hell because of Jesus Christ's passion on the cross. The humility and love that took Him from heaven emptied Him of all of His deity so that He would live as a servant and die as a criminal to save you. And all this is by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for Him. There's where I always struggle and go to prayer because I don't suffer in this world. <laughs> well, if I'm not, then what do I need to be doing with what I have? I'm not looking for that suffering or anything, but how am I living each day? That gives me an opportunity to share the gospel message right now. Why we can because there might be tomorrow where you can't so easily and it might cost you a lot more. Do you think if you're not firm in your foundation today and we're not bound together with one spirit, with one purpose, that we're going to be united on that day when persecution comes? Since you're all going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. They held firm to the gospel message, the faith that they have because of Jesus Christ and the spirit that indwelled in them. Therefore, that's the first words of Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and, one, and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking out for your own interests, but each of you for the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. The words here are, is if there is any paraclesis. Oh, that's a lot like the word given for the Holy Spirit that will come and be your comforter. Where Paul writes to the Corinthian church that the God of all comfort brings you comfort so that you can comfort others. Not so that you can be comforted and say, oh, things are better for me, but so that you can then use that to comfort others because you understand that. If you have any consolation, exhortation, comfort, encouragement with a calling alongside of the Holy Spirit of God in the purpose of the mission that Jesus Christ set to you to be His hands and feet, to make disciples and to teach them everything, uh, to obey everything that He taught. If you have any comfort that you're saved, you want to say, know that others become saved. You want to live out that life. If you have any of that comfort, to know that you have partnered alongside with Jesus Christ. If there is any paramethion, is the next word, any consolation and comfort because of the love of God and the love that He has for you and for others, that He did not destroy mankind, that instead He sent Jesus, the God-man, to save mankind. And if there is any kononia, fellowship, unity, family, intimacy by belonging to the family of God, then because of this comfort that you have, this partnership that you have, this peace that you have, if you have any bowels of mercy then, any tenderness in your heart, any compassion, even for those that don't deserve it, isn't that who I am? Weren't we all enemies when Christ died for us? If you have any mercy, sympathy, affection at all because of what Christ Jesus has done for you, then make my joy complete, complete by being what? Like-minded. And since you are like-minded, you have the same love. You are united with the Spirit. And you have one mind and one purpose. What is that purpose? You know, the problem is, again, so many churches in this country don't know what their purpose is. Oh, sure, there's plenty of programs and other things and they give to missions and everything else, but isn't your purpose to come in here and to get trained up so that we can go out there and we can fight this spiritual battle together to tell others about Jesus Christ? That's the ultimate goal. 
Because of you? Or because what Christ Jesus has done for you? Not looking out for my own interests, but for others. I mean, what about desires then? What is your heart focused on? Isn't that where your love is and everything? The literal word here is not looking out for the interests of others. It's looking out for the things of others. Isn't so much of our desires based on the things of this world so that they become idols? Uh, maybe that's why Barnabas again could sell everything he had and said distribute it so there wouldn't be any needy people among you. Because we work more in this country for things than we do just to be fed or to have shelter. We work so we can have more things. And we look at others and say, hmm, the reason you don't have things is fill in the blank. The reason we have things, the reason we have God's grace, the reason we have His peace is so that we can give those things to others by the way we live our lives and by the way we practice equality and things that the kings and kingdoms should have practiced. So then he comes into one step further in his teaching process. What was Jesus' mindset? I will challenge you again to go read these words over and over. This poem, this song, this hymn of what Christ Jesus did in his life. The King of kings, Lord of lords, gave up heaven, emptied himself of everything of his deity, became his creation that rebelled against him, Lived his life for them, not himself. Didn't have the things. Didn't have a place to lay his head is what Jesus said if you want to be his disciple. And then laid down his life in a horrific death silently before his accusers so that you could be lifted up with him in glory. Not just saved, but be rich as a child of God. First part of that, the first sentence is verses 6 through 8 who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Hey, I, get me a little more here because I'm an heir. Nope, I don't want to use anything for my advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. First sentence. Second sentence of that, we have the spiral down, if that's what you want to call it, to be raised up. If I don't humble myself, Jesus taught it time and time again, if you want to be the greatest, then you become the least of these. You become a servant of all. Therefore, because of what Jesus Christ did in his flesh, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Now and forevermore, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and in every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now you may not understand this so much because Jesus is God, Jesus is God. But because of what we see God did for us in Jesus Christ, we can worship Him more. Because He came flesh and blood, I can understand this. And that's how He did it in His life. And I'm supposed to follow after Him. Dute opisu mu, forsaking all else. I leave that behind and I look forward following Christ. Oh, then there's another therefore next, isn't there? <laughs> therefore, with this hymn that he brought us, verse 12, my dear friends, if you, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It is God who works in you to His will and to act in order to fulfill His good purpose. Oh, that's what my life is for? I thought it was mine. Do everything then without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. There we go, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Isn't that the cry of Hosea? Isn't that the cry of Jeremiah? Come to me, my children. Then you will shine among them, those in the world, because you let your light shine. You will not only let your light shine, but it'll be like the stars in the sky. I love, I don't know it all right now, but it just came to me now that if you go to see, um, is it the Washington Memorial that's the one straight up? Yeah. There is like, 
I don't know how many. We're just going to say this number. A million spotlights so that you can see that. All of the little spotlights you don't see are focused so you can see the monument. That's what your light is doing. It reflects Jesus Christ if you let it shine brightly. And you do this by being, becoming blameless and pure children of God without fault in this warped and crooked generation. Verse 16, as you hold firmly to the word of life, and then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run my labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and, and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Then he gives the example of Timothy who loves them more than he loves himself. And he gives the example of Epiditus who goes to help Paul and wants to go back to them because he's more concerned about Paul and more concerned about them. He doesn't worry about him himself, what's going to happen to him. He worries about the church. There's your two examples. I am going to give you a spoiler alert again because I am not going to be here next week. I'm going to go ahead and give you a little bit of chapter 3 and chapter 4 because I am confident you guys are going to read and do the, the uh, devotions and the uh, reading in front of you. In chapter 3, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Is that how you feel? Paul's building this letter up. It says, Nothing in this world matters more than your life for Jesus Christ. What is more, I now consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus from my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, garbage, something to be thrown away. I'm not worried about them at all that I may gain Christ. He goes on in chapter 3, he says, I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Every day that we live another day, we're one day closer to the end of our lives, to coming face to face with Jesus Christ. Shouldn't we be living it in more urgency than we did the day before? It just makes sense. <clears throat> All of us then who are mature should take such view of things. And if at some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already obtained. I have obtained salvation through Jesus Christ. Am I working out my salvation with fear and trembling? Verse 17, joining together and following my examples, brothers and sisters, just as, you, just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For, as I have often told you before and now tell you again with tears, many live as enemies of the cross, even though they, of Christ cross of Christ, even though they profess to be Christians. Their life does not show it, does it? If you're an enemy of Jesus rather than his friends, you will die in your sins. He came while you were his enemy to make you his brother, his friend, to get the inheritance of what a child of God should have. Do you believe this and are you living for it? Verse 19, for their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, the things that they desire, the things they gobble up, the things that they live off of. And their glory is in their shame. Jesus gave up heaven, came to earth, died on the cross, was raised to glory to take you with him. Their mind is set. Their mind is set on earthly things, not set on Jesus' mind. They gave up everything, emptied himself, made himself a servant slave, and died for you. Is that how you live? Is that your mindset? Chapter 4, Paul says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, what is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, 
think about these things. Whatever you learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Are you putting into practice what Jesus has taught you? Are you obeying? Are you making disciples? Or do you have other loves that you need to get rid of so that you're faithful to the one who was faithful to you, who gave up everything to save you? Do you think of others over yourself? Do you think of their needs and then do you do something about their needs? I mean, Jesus Christ did everything for their need, for your need. Will you live for him? Father in heaven, I thank you and praise you. I thank you that the Holy Spirit has come into our lives to teach us to renew our mind by getting rid of the things that have such control over it so that instead our bowels of mercy, our heart is on the things of Jesus Christ so that we live our lives passionately for him, for others, so that we can learn to even love our enemies. Oh, Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for what Jesus Christ did here in the flesh and what he is continuing to do with the Holy Spirit and his people to make children of the Most High in this crooked and perverse world. May our light shine brightly as this church, Lord. May we light up this Jerusalem that you have given us as far as ministry, Lord, and wherever we come in contact. May we be the salt of the earth. May we be a light on a hill shining at Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you in his name. Amen. Stand with us, please.